Hello everyone, I hope you are having a wonderful time and at SPX we are very happy to have you here because we have a wonderful panel of four amazing artists who have fantastic work so I think we are all going to enjoy how they are going to narrate their experience working with the concept of the fiction, the concept of the fantastic and science fiction, how they articulate their work from the dimension of developing characters and how their characters interact with the concept of the landscape, the space where they are trying to figure out their storytelling. So we have a Tyrell Waiters, Casey Novak, Hannah Templer, and Julia Gottfeld. So what we are going to do is I'm going to start showing their work so we have a sense of uh, what is their work about and you can figure out after their talk and their conversation to look for their books, to look for their signature on, on the stage upstairs. And in the case of uh, the work of Tyrell, we are going to discover the character of Bern and as, as you see, the, the concept of the, the custodian of the universe is, is going to be linked, I think, with social class and the trying, a, a character who is trying to find himself in a very uh, similar society of ours today, where young people is out of work, trying to look for their life. And suddenly, we are going to go to the experience of the metaverse, the experience of um, the complexities of this um, world of possibilities, but from a kind of class, the conflict of class. And I hope, Tyrell, you can speak a little bit about how did you develop your character with that tension and that complexity. Yeah. Um, when it came to creating Burn, I kind of based Burn similar to myself because I was going through a, a weird situation a few years prior to that because I originally started my career off working in apparel and I got my first job working at Abercrombie & Fitch. It was like a really rad job. I was doing all this stuff and I really wanted to quit because I hated the job. <laughs> and I did not like how they handled things within the organization. So I wanted to quit, waited around for a few years and then I randomly just got laid off and I was like, this sucks. <laughs> and I didn't really necessarily know what I wanted to do and I was in a weird state where I was kind of like in limbo, where I either go home and struggle at home and deal with the fact like, if I go home, I'll have my security blanket and I won't do what I said I was gonna do anymore because now I have all these other people that I could depend on to help me rather than me helping myself. So instead, I stayed, I struggled. I did not land a job for months. I ran through my savings. I was like, this sucks. and. Randomly, I got an opportunity. I traveled to San Francisco and met my wife and had this whole other experience. And it was like an entirely different world after that. And when it came to creating Vern, I tied all that struggle and all that other nonsense that I was going through into Vern. And it helped me understand like where I wanted to go next from there. Exactly. So yeah, exactly, because you're giving a human dimension. So mm -hmm. that's what is beautiful in all these works, that there is a very complex human dimension about emotions. So, so you're going to have the fantastic on the pieces, but you also have the beauty, the literary beauty of the human dimension yep. and that complexities. Yep. So just I'm showing some of the pages, the fantastic pages that you work. And then I'm going to jump to Julia. So in the case of Julia, just so everyone got, can get a, a sense of each of you, then we are going to keep talking and discuss it. In the case of Julia, it's very interesting because we are going to see two women trying to reach you know, the, the complexities of discovery. And suddenly, one of them is a scientific, and they are going to find themselves in a pit that the pit it transformed itself to to a character itself. So, and, and it's, it's linked with the tradition of the golem. So, it's, so you are going back to kind of a faith and the construction of, of the complexities of faith 
and how nature is going to interact to develop a very new story. For me, it was like a kind of reading The Immortal of Borges, Jorge Luis Borges. So I, you are trying to, to reach uh, the relationship between two people, linking with the tradition of the past and a kind of a strange future. So tell us about your two characters and how did you reach that? Yeah, um, so primarily my work before this graphic novel was autobiographical. So I've done a lot of like diary comics and short memoir comics. So I'm really like used to putting myself in comics. And I feel like for these two characters, it's sort of like, like um, two aspects of myself. It's um, a couple and one of them is really interested in sort of like scientific discovery and one of them is a lot more, um, is just sort of like tagging along and has a lot of sort of like emotions along the way. So it's sort of like a rational and emotional character. Um, and then a lot of my like diary and memoir comics, um, I use sort of like abstract shapes to kind of like amplify emotions or explore emotions and in this like it was really taking that landscape that they're in to kind of like amplify their feelings um, and their like struggles um, and you know taking that literally so that the soil that they're in is actually like reacting to them and sort of exploring like emotions and their relationship through that. So good. Um how did you came with the idea of naming the golem? So, uh, it's yeah, it's um. So I'm Jewish, so I grew up with the idea of like a, a golem of uh, like knowing the story of that um, of of this sort of sentient land that um, you can inscribe things into, and it'll like like sort of like help um, but can also sort of like backfire depending on what you inscribe into it um, and sort of simultaneously I came up with like like a lot of times I work with visuals first so I had sort of like visuals of like landscape having anthropomorphic aspects and I was like oh this like this makes sense and those two sort of like ideas combined. So, um, yeah, so it's very interesting because with Tyrell, we are going to end in a building. Mm -hmm. So uh, with you, we are jumping to the landscape. Mm -hmm. And both places are mm -hmm. touching the characters, making the characters react. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we are going to move to Cosmo Nights. <laughs> so uh, in the case of Hannah, we are having like a choral, choral setting of multiple characters interacting. And uh, for Hannah, the complexity of, of how to fight the patriarchy from the space of a society in the future. It's a futuristic society of many planets. And I start with two, so we are in the, with the previous pieces, we are in the present, and things are happening in this present. But in the case of Hannah, we are in a kind of future or parallel world, futuristic, where it starts with two teenagers, but suddenly, you know, the, the, the narr narration is going in more directions because more characters are interacting, but we discovered in a kind of strat stratic society where women are kind of possessed and they are princes and they, you have to fight for this power of princes. So things are getting very complicated when women are trying to broke that rule of domination. So tell us about how you put together that society. Sure. Um, so Cosmonites is a space opera. It's very campy. It's very fun, action-packed. Um, but it does, yes, as you said, it starts out with two, uh, two teenagers who are best friends. And the world does feel very familiar. It feels like it could be taking place on Earth. And uh, the, my goal with the beginning of the story is to make it really f just feel like, oh, these are two teens hanging out. But there are clues that this might not be our world. There's two moons in the sky, and then there's uh, spaceships landing, and you quickly realize, oh, this girl is a princess. Like, there's much more to this world. Um, and so I really wanted to create these. The main character, Pan, the protagonist, is um, someone who really is a fish out of water. <laughs> like, she is someone who is discovering her world at the same time we are. She comes from a very, like, small planet at the edge of the galaxy and she helps her best friend run away when she's a teenager because her friend doesn't want to be 
uh, married off as a princess in these big cosmic jousting matches with jetpack armor and, again, super action-packed and fun. Um, and so the world kind of unfolds from there, and Pan becomes this, you know, this girl who works in her dad's uh, auto shop on this little planet to someone who runs away with these two women mech fighters and discovers her universe, and we kind of discover the universe alongside her as she's also discovering kind of her gender identity and her sexuality and... Uh, yeah. So, so yes. Yeah. So we suddenly see this complexity. So there is social issues. There is also fantasy elements about, and there is also medieval structures on the fights and how they are trying to figure out the reality and, on, and all these complexities. Then we are going to jump to to Casey, and in in the case of Casey, is is working with a kind of medieval society of fantastic fantasy society where uh, the relationships of fear, of failure to the communal group is very in deep and also is very emotional. So uh, we see kind of a theatrical relationship of thoughts and emotions. It's very, very interesting because we, we see all these communal groups, how they interact, but how the characters feel so it's very, tell us. Well, oh, I, that's, I, I love your reaction, for, for one. Um, but uh, yeah, um, Body Seed uh, takes place on another planet. Um, and it's, it's kind of like, like she said, it's kind of like a medieval setting. Um, and <laughs> the, this chapter, well, okay, so it's kind of, it's hard to talk about body seed for me for some reason, but, uh, and I always, I'm always like, that's a good thing, that means it's good or something, but um, <laughs> it's really kind of about the relationship between your body and the world around you, and it's about the way people affect one another, and it's also about the fact that no one can read another person's mind. Um, and uh, it's trans, it's like a lot about being trans because uh, I think, it's like about being trans and it's about like following symbols because I think like like gender and sexuality and you know society in general is very like symbol driven. And I don't just mean like crosses or you know, spirals or something, I mean like the symbol of like, like heteronormative people, like that's a symbol. Um, and so in the first chapter of Body Seed, the main character is drunk on a beach and they start pleasuring themselves. And then <laughs> the moon kind of explodes. Um, <laughs> and then they're just like racked with guilt because they think it's their fault. Um, so, I felt like a genius. Um, <laughs> so I, I think you could like just tell from like that little synopsis what I'm trying to go for, where it's like, I'm trying, like it's, it's kind of about people trying to figure out like, where is my place or something, or like, what is, what is my power in like, I don't know, it's so hard to talk about, because it's gonna be like this long fantasy epic that was like thousands and thousands of pages, so it's about kind of everything. But that's what the first chapter is about. Mm -hmm. And what we see in the, in the four pieces is the concept of commitment to society, trying to understand themselves. And we see in both in the, in the four works, like how in the development of the characters, they try to look for answers. So they, all, are, all our, our work is trying to look for answers. So I will go and ask you, all of you, what do you want the reader to get with things do you, with words, with ideas for you are the most important of, of your pieces for the reader to get? Um, yeah. 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 Um, so I think one of the things that I really wanted to focus on is the, the interaction that we have with our environment. Like, so this is, is you know, like a, like a metaphor for the way that we treat our earth in a way like like it's a reactive thing I, I think we don't really think about it as like a, a reactive thing um very often so I guess like sort of interrogating the way that we we treat our 
different spaces. Um, yeah, and I guess um, so sort of the 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 way that our like emotions tie into that kind of I don't know if that that like makes sense but in the story the the protagonist Thea like like the more sort of like violently that she reacts to the environment the more violent the the environment acts towards her um and the sort of like the like interconnection of those things um where she's like like she's like a part of the environment like it's it's a reflection of her um and yeah so this is in this story it's it's like a sci-fi like thing but it's a it's a metaphor for how how we are with um the way that we we interact with our our spaces and the people around us as well yeah yeah um when it comes to Vern, uh, i i I think it was more of like self-discovery um, and exploration. I think a lot of us have, we set goals for ourselves of like what we want to do in life and you set that net so far and you try to achieve it by any means possible. But sometimes that path you're trying to go down is actually not the path you were meant to go down. And I've learned that the hard way where it's kind of like a moment to actually take a step back and breathe for a moment just to really view what's in front of you rather than what you think you see. And that's literally what Vern is going through where he gets tossed into a situation that is told is one thing, but it's actually not that at all. And you have the one person that a lot of people don't really put a lot of respect on anymore, which is your elders who've already walked that path that you're already going down. And this elder, which is his grandmother, is explaining to him like, listen, what you think is what you're supposed to be doing, that might not be it. Like, the universe has a plan for you. You just need to be patient and, like, watch it come to you. And that was, like, an experience I've gone through personally where I thought I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And I got, that's like that old saying, like, tell God your plans and watch him mm -hmm. laugh at you. And that's literally what Vern is going through, where he's going through all the stuff that he never imagined would ever happen. And I think that's, like, the beauty of it. So. I think when a reader reads it, it's one of those things of like, you might catch yourself thinking like, oh, all right, I thought I would be a doctor, but now I'm doing this <laughs> over here. So I think that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. The mystery of life. So exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm really obsessed with a few things. Um, first of all, I'm obsessed with like the existence of life and the existence of the human body and the existence of the human brain. And the fact that um, it can make choices, which is completely unique. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with the interpretation of the body, like what when people, <laughs> what society has decided bodies are for, and which bodies are for are for what purpose, and um, you know, like the the deep history of um, of that kind of thing because you know hum humanity was so ignorant in its infancy and you just take whatever you see and you ascribe meaning mm -hmm. and that is so incredible to me like I'm really obsessed with the with humans and pattern recognition and um, I think obviously that goes into gender as well and I think there's so much there's so much to be written about gender that hasn't been written yet. I get really excited about that, um, and there's like so many interesting interesting new perspectives these days on it. And that's anyone who thinks that's not totally cool is not going to be my friend. Um, and uh, I'm also really obsessed with uh, the difference between the person you are inside and the person that you project mm -hmm. and how whoever you are is a combination of those things uh, and how whoever you are is a combination of who you are and who people think you are. Like, I, I don't know, I find that all so fascinating. Like, images, you know, like, 
there's the real thing and then there's the image of the thing and it naturally deforms the thing. You know, I, I like, I just think that stuff is so incredible. And um, that's just what I'm playing with in Body Seed, just having fun with all of that stuff. Um, you mentioned Borges earlier. I'm extremely inspired by Borges. Every time I read a Borges thing, I'm just like, the universe is so full of mystery and it's amazing. Like, yeah, highly recommend. <laughs> So in terms of kind of what I want to do with uh, my book, Cosmonites, I mean, at its core, it is a very personal story, which is really funny to say because it's set in space and it's got like space jousting and princesses and royal families and planets. But it really is about being a, like a queer individual in a world that was built without you and was built like without considering you and kind of how, like, how to navigate that as someone who doesn't fit in that system and so um you know it is like very on the nose like there are these jousts for the hands of princesses but these two lesbian mech warriors are fighting to free the princesses instead of win their hands in marriage and they whisk them away to like free them on a faraway planet and so it's this the story of this young girl who not only has her ring of keys moment when she meets one of these like lesbian warriors and is like wow you're hot but also she's <laughs> discovering like her like a greater purpose in her life, which is a very, I'm, I came out really late in life. I came out at 27 and I was actually already married to a man. And so I had this like really wild year of like separating myself from um, like heteronormative expectations and the way I was raised in a really religious family and kind of discovering like, wow, none of this has ever fit me. And I had to fight really, really hard to get out of that. And I almost likened the, the very campy, like jousting in mech suits. It really felt gladiatorial, like getting out of a like really bad situation. And so, um, yeah, basically like the story is also very personal for me, kind of uh, talking about someone who not only is discovering sort of their sexuality and their gender identity, but is also discovering their, like, their purpose in life. And those things are completely intertwined. And um, you know, the direct action of like, we're gonna steal these princesses and like destroy the system or whatever. Um, the energy behind that is just very, very personal. And also it's the story I would have loved to read when I was 13 years old. I was like this kid who was totally gay, but totally repressed and had no idea what I wanted. And I would have just loved to read a story where like the gays are doing cool stuff in space. Like that's just fun, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so we are discovering the mystery of creativity because all these stories are fiction. There is all the element of science fiction, but at the same time, we see all the emotions mm -hmm. behind this creativity and the way they narrate their characters and they project their own emotions. So it's why they read so well, because you engage with what they feel. You believe in what they feel, because it's part of their creativity. So there is a lot of beauty on the narrative dimension of these comics, but there is also a lot of beauty on the craft sheet, on the artistic dimension. That is the wonderful thing of comics, that we have different levels of, of pleasure when we read. So now let's, let's talk about that creative dimension, that beauty of the page. <laughs> so we are showing images, and Julia can tell us about how do you create, how do you craft these wonderful pages? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so like I, I was saying before, a lot of a lot of times I start with the the visual aspect. Like I just start drawing, and that's how like I, I come up with ideas and longer pieces. Like I feel like I'm um, one of my big like comics heroes um, is Linda Berry, um, and she just like wants you to just like use like just keep drawing, like trace something, draw something, like get your hand moving, and like it will kind of tell you where to go. Um, so it was really like, like I, you know, I was actually working on a, a pitch for a different project that was way more like grounded. Um, and this was kind of like a, like a side project that I was doing, but then I was like, oh, like I really don't like working on the pitch as much as I like doing this. <laughs> like, so I, I kept, going with this um, and just like, you know, like doing the meditative swirling lines. Like I 
feel like for me it's almost like an anti-anxiety thing to just like do a lot of like line making um and then you know like the shapes appear and I'm like well what is what is this about like how can I like put this into a story like what are these like anthropomorphic blobs like what happens if they're like in real life like what would that mean what would it be like for characters to interact with them like what is that story so for me like it really stems from like the need for me to be like constantly making marks um, and everything else kind of just follows from that. Mm -hmm. And with the page life for you like the medallions, <laughs> you know, these elements that are your, your style and also the perspective, how you work with, mm -hmm. with different perspective on, on, the, on the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. And now, Tyler, how did you work the page? Here we have this beautiful page okay. where you transform. How, how, how did you sit to work the pages? Tell us. I'm a weirdo. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty odd when it comes to actually working on a page. So with Vern, I technically, this one's going to be weird. I worked backwards. Oh, wow. So I originally drew everything out in an entirely different style when I was approached about the actual project itself, I asked, could I do it again? <laughs> so I started from scratch with the book. So I normally never sketch anything. I don't do any process work. I don't do color theory. I just go. I'm very, that's why I said I'm odd. So I just hit the page and I go running. So I don't use reference. I don't follow anything. I just go right off the top of my head and just go with it. Looks like poetry, the intuitive way. Yeah, yeah. so everything's written in my head. And I'll, I'll say what I think I want, and I already know the visual. So if someone, like, that's how I work with clients. If a client tells me what they want, as they're talking, a visual is literally in my head, and I'll just put it down on paper. So when it came to doing these, my thought was literally like, how cool can I make something, and I want a wow factor. I want someone to see it and be like, that's cool. How'd you do that? Mm -hmm. And just really beg the question of like, how'd you do this process? And also I used to do storyboards. So my whole thing was like, if this was to turn into something, could this translate well in animation? And it just flow. So that's my whole process. I work by flow and um. I just do it as I go. Cause I feel like if I, if I stop myself to do process, it uh, basically, make the work for me longer than it actually has to be. So that's why I just go freeform and, and do it. It just feels more natural that's to me. That's good. Casey. You'll also get just like different results. Exactly. Completely different results when you do that. Yeah. Um, oh, I... <laughs> 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 this this chapter was like a real a real labor, but I actually um I drew the whole thing really really tiny first, and then I blew it up and I traced that. Um, but this whole page in particular, I drew a couple of times. I was really trying to get this character right and this whole scene to be natural. Um, what can I say about process? Uh, sometimes I work from a really specific script, sometimes I don't. It feels like I work differently every time I sit down to work on something. I wish that wasn't true, because I think I would be faster or something, but I don't know, I get like excited about trying new things. Um, but yeah, I don't, I also don't really use references. I kind of, um, you know, everything you see here was made with the YouTube, YouTube bomb listening to watching YouTube's, so, uh, you know, <laughs> that's part of my process. What did you choose, uh, black and white? Oh, for this one? Yeah. Uh, I actually, like, I struggle with, with that decision so much. It, I just, if I have to think about color, I don't think I'll make the comic, you know? <laughs> if I have to think about color, I, I think I'll just be too scared. Like, I, I like color comics, and I like making color comics, but, like, this is gonna be long, and I, I just can't set that precedent, you know? Mm -hmm. So you were playing more with emotions, with the narrate. Yeah, yeah, and I also think that my line work is like really sick, so I don't, <laughs> I don't think that like color would really add that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, your ink 
jokes are unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's move. Yeah. Oops. I think I got it. No, I'm, I'm a Mac, as person as you can see. <laughs> There's this kind of computer. Sorry. It was touching here, no? No, not touching. I was like touching somewhere. So, Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, well, to talk about, like, the visual approach, it, again, like, it, it's very personal for me um, and, like, contextualizing where I was at. So I, this was my, like, debut graphic novel, and I had been doing comics sort of on the side for many years um, and never really prioritized it. Like, my life was basically, like, <laughs> I was part of this really, really intense church, some might call it a cult, and it took, seriously, and it took all my time, like, and then I was married, and there was all these expectations of, like, cook for your husband, then you're going to have kids. Like, it was really, I mean, wild. And so I... Was I, I was married, too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, not a great situation. But I, I put so much of myself, like, to the side, and so everything that I worked on for so many years was so, I can only describe it as, like, unambitious. And, like, then <laughs> when I, like left my job, got a divorce, moved out, lived on my own. Like I did everything all at once. And I was like, I'm gonna say yes to myself, which sounds really corny, but like, what do I, what would I create if like, I wasn't going to like put any limitations on myself and like just do the thing that I wanted. And I was very much going through a second adolescence as well because I'd never got to be gay <laughs> like when I was a teenager and like understanding uh, that stuff. So it happened for me at 27. And I was just like, let me make the thing, like I said, like, like let me make the thing that I would have loved to see when I was 13. Let me be super self-indulgent. Like, I just want to draw a bunch of, like, beautiful women. <laughs> so I did that. Um, but also just, like, having so much fun with, like, color. I had never done a comic in color before. I had never, like, finished a comic. So the Cosmonites actually started as, like, a 20-page comic that I was like, I'm going to go to my first festival, and I'm going to finish something, and I'm going to bring it and it immediately, like people immediately connected with it and I was like blown away. Um, it, I put it online and immediately like, oh my gosh, like I just, it blew my mind how many people connected with it and I was like, there's really something to like being ambitious and like putting your heart into something um, and not like <laughs> saying no to yourself all the time. Isn't it funny when you, when you learn like a really cliche lesson and you're yeah. like, Oh, that, it is true. <laughs> it is oh, true what they say. Yeah, like, very embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like it, re and it just brought me a lot of joy. So, um, you know, I was lucky enough that from there immediately, like a publisher approached and was like, "Let's make the whole thing." And I actually didn't have a plan to like make any, like, to finish the story. I just jumped into this like wild and crazy epic with like no real plan, <laughs> um, and it just. It's been really amazing. So again, the art is very much like, I'm very inspired by a lot of like, uh, like Atlantis, the Lost Empire and Treasure Planet are my two favorite <laughs> oh movies. Oh my God, Treasure just, Planet. Yes, yeah, it's all like, I just, I just returned to that and was like, let me use like uh, all the colors I want to mm. and draw these like wild spacescapes and just like really let myself like have a lot of fun and not, you know, overthink things and not put constraints on myself that are ridiculous and yeah. uh, that's, Ah, uh, Jimbo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, Treasure Planet rules. It's a it's oh, a yeah. great movie. Atlantis um, sucks, but that's no. fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hannah opened the box of influence. Like, which 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 are your influences, and which which things do you find dialogue? So, it can be comics, mm -hmm. it can be movies, it can be books, it can be traveling experiences. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, so I, um, when I was writing this, I think there's like two books that I read that were really influential that I like really loved the, the feeling and the vibe of. One of them is um, Piranesi by Susanna Clark, which is like this awesome book about like a parallel universe where there's just like, endless corridors and like there's like an ocean inside and it was it was just like a real like world building thing where it, it was like I've never like thought about a world like that um and also like the you're kind of like in the mind of someone who's like also trying to figure it out um so it's sort of like looking at it from like a like a scientific like note taking kind of like way of trying to figure out this world um and then also um, the like 
uh, Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer was like, I love that <laughs> book, um, and the uh, Southern Reach trilogy, and and that's like also kind of a like like there's a group of scientists like exploring this like weird happening of like these sort of like animal and plant things that are just real strange and they have like human cells in them and it's just like in both of these books like they don't really like there it's not as much about like why is this happening it's it's more just like like looking at these like weird phenomenon and being like like trying to like wrap your head around it um and the like i guess i didn't really like think when I was doing Gollum Pit, like specifically about that, but like looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, like I was reading those two things and like it just like made its way into it. Like like this like weird phenomenon that people are um, exploring. And I just, I just like love, like <laughs> I love weird things. Or like when there's like a, like a piece of literature that like presents like a, a, like a world or, or something that I've like, I haven't like seen that anywhere before and I haven't like thought about that. Um, and just sort of like that, ex the excitement of that and like how to create that. Um, and you know, I, I created a world and like maybe it does some of those things or not, but oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for me, I, I wanted to explore kind of like the unknown, technically. Um, when I was creating this, I, 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 like I said again, I'm a little odd. Um, I try not to follow anything. I do, I do that too. Yeah. I do that too. And the reason for that is I keep my slate clean. Therefore, I don't really try to mimic or copy or take something from anyone else. I want anything I'm working on to be mine. I get, I get like nervous about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I get where you come from, and it, I think during this process was like, how far can I actually push the envelope? And the reason I think in that manner, when I worked in apparel, they have a set limit of how you are meant to design something. And I met a, a boss at one point where he was literally like, I'd rather see how far you go to tell you stop rather than me tell you stop and you don't want to go. Mm. And now that's how I take everything in. I, I push as far as I can. So when it came to creating the world, I was like, well, I want to jump through universes. I want to go to planets. I want to explore the unexplored. I want to try to figure out things that I think, because I'm a conspiracy person, I love it. <laughs> I love stuff like that. It really gets my like blood pumping. So I was literally like, okay, well, what could I push? And even when it came to Quasar, the company that Vern works for, I had a whole backstory. So when I was talking to Nobra, I broke it down. I was like, listen, this place called Quasar, it exists, it's in Florida. It's basically a mock-up of, like NASA is basically a backup plan because Quasar screwed something up. NASA basically came in its place, therefore no one knows about Quasar. And it was like a really cool concept where it's like, well, what if there was a NASA before NASA? Like, how does this work? And then it's like all these unexplored territories that you could touch. So it's like a world within a world that you could go. And it's in Florida, and Florida's a world within a world. It's, come on, you got it, Florida? Yeah, and I'm from Florida, I'm weird. So <laughs> I get it, you know? And I wanted to put that out there and just have something be explored and have a reader read it and wonder like, oh, what else could be here? And that's why it's based in the multiverse. So I now could expand that anywhere I want. And that's what I'm working on now, currently. Good. Um, when, when it comes to influence, uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> I grew up watching Star Trek. So that's like, that was like my baseline. Like I just, when I was a child, I was obsessed with it. Um, and I feel really lucky because, um, I don't know, Next Generation in particular, it's a very curious show. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always like posing these questions. I don't know, it made me, it really made me who I am in certain ways. Like, I don't know, like just the, there's like an open-mindedness to it. You know, I don't know. 
I also DS9 is actually my favorite because things get a little more complicated and it's more about like people interacting. But anyways, um, when it comes to Body Seed, it's funny because I get <sighs> there's this movie called Hard to Be a God, and I've never seen it. But I've seen the trailer and I've read the synopsis. And like that was enough. I was like, the trailer is unbelievable. Like it completely blew my mind when I was in college. And like in the same way that like the human centipede trailer did, where I was just like, it was serious. I mean, it's oh. seriously just like, wow, I have never ever seen something like this before. Like, Hard to Be a God is about um it's set on an alien world, which is, and it has like a medieval society, and uh, people from Earth have come to the medieval society to try and rescue the intellectuals who are being like, I don't, I don't even know because I haven't seen it. <laughs> so someday I will. Um, but there's also a book called The Book of the New Sun, which it's, it's a quadrilogy, and it's, it's kind of similar. It's actually, it's set in the very, very, very far future. Um, and it's about a torturer. Um, and uh, what else can I say about it? I don't know, it's great. And it actually, I read that and there's some blurbs on the back that mentioned Borges, which is how I started reading Borges. Mm. And then Borges led me to Umberto Eco and I read Foucault's Pendulum a couple of years ago during a manic episode. And, like the whole, the whole, my whole obsession with like symbols and, and like, um, you know, like I said, like the real things versus images of things really comes from that, that book, which is phenomenal. It's not, it's not even really sci-fi, but yeah. And Italo Calvino, that's another one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I spoke a little bit <laughs> to a couple of my influences, obviously Treasure Planet and Atlantis, <laughs> classics. Um, and honestly, a lot, I think I have like two, I, when I started doing comics seriously, which was like maybe 2016, I feel like I just got overloaded with like all my peers and the incredible work they were doing. And so um, like a lot of my like more current influences were like Sam Alden was like a huge influence for me. Um, and uh, Sam Bosma, obviously. Uh, I also really love um, the, the colors in this webcomic called Cucumber Quest that um, isn't around anymore, but fantastic to look at. I just remember like sort of opening my mind to all this stuff that I had just not like really even thought about, and it just like overwhelmed me with influence um, just visually. But then also, <laughs> I am very much trapped in 2003, and I think that's for many reasons I was... <laughs> 14 that year and it just that's a time when your brain is like sucking in a lot of influence so like the matrix but not the first one matrix reloaded specifically <laughs> very influential for me very important movie um <laughs> yeah i saw it seven times in theaters so yeah. the part with the pie or the cake yep. or whatever so <laughs> i was funny. really interested in that's that one of the, like in retrospect that was that was awesome it's a wild movie monica bellucci's in it and it yeah, it influenced me a lot. Um, also, uh, <laughs> Titan AE. I don't know if people remember that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Movie. yeah, hell yeah. That's <laughs> um, so that's a great. Yeah, just like I love that, and I also I think I what happened is I really love that era of movie uh, and film. Like that, there was a time when like we had the Mummy and like all these like action packed, very like corny, can't be advanced, but they were very unapologetic and very fun. And um, I think we do occasionally get films like that now, but. There was just do. It's always like wow. Yeah, no, exactly. It sucks. It's it sucks how, how it's like so rare now. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I just rough. I love them because they are very self indulgent. And I just like that really really influenced me. Like if I just want to make something fun that like isn't doesn't feel like I don't know. I do I do love to like think about my work and I do pour a lot into it. But I also just really love to have fun with it. I mean I I life is short like <laughs> let me have fun um so that that really uh drives a lot of my work too yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. fantastic so we are learning a lot about this amazing work that i hope to go upstairs and get all of them with their signatures because it's a unique opportunity so i'm going to open up for one or two questions because we are short in time so if you have a question you have to go to the there's the corners is anyone having a hitting question 
If you don't, I can drop another question. <laughs> Uh, hello. But there is one question. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, this is for Julia. Have you read Junji Ito's Spiral? Because those images from Gollum Pit to 24 just seem very reminiscent of like abstract concept that you're not quite sure what it is. Or I I should like people yeah. have brought it that up to me, and I have not yet. But <laughs> I will. Like an animation coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> We have five minutes for another question. Because <laughs> we are recording, is why you have to speak to the micro. Sorry, I should come around first. Um, I wanted to know about how creating other worlds and sort of inventing kind of fantasy sci-fi worlds allows you to explore things you want to talk about in our current society mm. and worlds. For all of you, of course. <laughs> in, in a short response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, I, th I think for me, like uh, environmentalism and like the the mm. constant crushing fear of like climate change, like is something that like I'm like I don't know what to do about it, but I can like make this and you know at least talk about it. You go. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think that people are. I don't blame social media. Don't don't think this is a this is a too much phones thing. Um, I have a real fear of people being isolated. I really get stressed out thinking about people being alone. Um, and I think I think that kind of isolation can lead to you know violence, fascism. Uh, so I in my work I I try to make caring about people seem cool. <laughs> I, I told that to my boyfriend the other day and I was like, is that so corny? And he said no, but he loves me, so I don't know. <laughs> That's like, oh, yeah. yeah, I just like, it just freaks me out thinking about like, <laughs> I, I'm just gonna keep repeating myself, freaks me out thinking about people being isolated, that's all. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I mean, I found it like a really a good vehicle to use this like um, anachronistic sort of like medieval joust, but set in space because it feels very familiar to have like really antiquated like laws and like this system that it doesn't really work for anybody except very, very wealthy people in this universe. Hey, this all sounds really familiar. So like, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it just made a lot of sense for me to kind of have like this universe where there is a lot of advanced technology, but like who gets access to that and who benefits from that and who lives outside of that world and has to kind of function in their own, on their own sort of terms and figure out like how to navigate, again, how to navigate this world that was built without you. So yeah. uh, it made a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah, and I think for me it was more of like understanding, well, no knock to anyone, but most people's attention spans are really small nowadays. So it's like visually, how can you create something that's visually stimulating and with a story that can easily adapt within one span where someone reads it, they automatically click and they may not get it, but as it goes on, they'll catch it. And I also talk about environmental as well because I think it's important. And for me, it's like, if it doesn't attack from us, it would also hit the younger generation at some point and they might get it and then take that and run with it. And I think that's the beauty of it, personally, because even with visual books, an adult loves it, but a kid will love it even more once they actually get it in their hands and actually understand it more. And that's what I wanted to get at with what I was doing. So we have very short time, like two minutes. So I would like to know mm -hmm. two words, one word that define your comic and one word that define, like you come out, uh, your relationship with comics. Your comic and your relationship. Mm. <laughs> That's hard. Mm. <laughs> uh, 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 that is your There's comic. kids in here, <laughs> right? I think F word both counts. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's hilarious. I think uh, stimulating, and I would say, hmm. Jeez, <laughs> I, I don't know, I would, I would say journey, uh -huh. mm. than anything. Yeah, yeah for, for my comic, I think Eerie, it's an eerie comic, and um, 
for my relationship to comics is just adoration. I just love comics. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it's joy and unapologetic. Like those two things are the combination. Yeah. Friends. That's another one. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, with this beautiful panel of fantastic artists, I say thank you very much for this honor thank and you. opportunity. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Ah, yes, please, please say so I'm at W28A. Uh, W76 through 78. Uh, I12A. And I'm at H14B. Nice. Um, get all the comics are fantastic. I love them. I have a pleasure reading them. They are great. Great work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.